Good morning. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. I am so glad that we can worship God together. I, uh, I do have very happy news for you today. Today we welcome Shirley Carlton and her husband Terence Morris. So I don't know if you want to stand up so people can see you. But <laughs> It's wonderful that you're here. It's wonderful to be here. It's such a warm welcome. Shirley is a student at Vancouver School of Theology. This is her final year earning her Master of Divinity. And so she will be with us all the way through to next April. And you will see her doing different things. And we're just thrilled that the two of you are here. And so I hope that you'll take a time to say hello during the coffee hour and we'll get to know you. I do have some other announcements. The Wednesday Bible study is starting this week. We meet on Zoom at 10.30. I send you the invitation and the materials so that you can read. The Wednesday Bible study is always related to the, the sermon on Sunday. So it's a wonderful way to prepare for hearing God's word on Sunday. So I encourage you to try it. Um, the Thursday Bible study is starting a week Thursday. The deadline for our newsletter is tomorrow, so if you wish to submit something, please send it to Sue tomorrow. And finally, our garage sale is this coming Saturday from 9 till 12. You can bring your treasures to the church starting September 15th, and I encourage you to, to give out the, the posters that are uh, in the narthex so that we can spread the word. Let's prepare for worship with a few moments of silent prayer. Let's pray. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Please join me in the call to worship. O oh God, you have searched us and known us. You know when we sit down and when we rise. You discern our thoughts from far away. Before a word is on your tongues, Lord, do you know it completely. Such knowledge is too wonderful for us, and so we humble ourselves in worship. In this hour, Search us and know our hearts, O oh God, and lead us in the way of everlasting. Let's stand and sing to God's praise, immortal, invisible, God only wise. Please stand. <laughs> Storytelling God, 
we gather in your presence this day called by the stories of your people over the centuries. You are the source of wisdom we seek. Your mercy eases the troubles that stir in our hearts. And we come to praise you, for your stories have the power to challenge us and change us. Draw near to us as we draw near to you this day. Tell us the stories that will change our lives through the grace of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn is May the People Praise You. Please stand. to hear the stories he told, to gather wisdom, and to know your spirit's guidance. Yet we confess that pride prevents us from hearing the good news and that we resist the power of your word to change us. Forgive what we have been. Help us amend who we are and set us free to be who you have called us to be. For we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. 
Amen. St. Paul said, who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for you, Christ rose for you, Christ reigns in power for you, Christ intercedes for you. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and set free by God's most generous grace. Amen. Let us sing Hope of the Nations. Please stand. forward? Would you like to come? Come on up. Come sit with Janet in the front. You, you can hear from there too, Walter, because I have a great mic. Good morning. So, we are all back at school now, back in our regular programs of school and preschool and daycare, and I want us to think for a minute about the number of people that includes. So, how many people are in your class, Drayden, do you know? Have you counted yet? I think there's 20. I think that's the maximum for your age. So 20 kids. And how many classes are there in your school? I'm guessing probably 10 at least. No? Smaller? Bigger? Bigger. 45 classes? That's a lot. Now, I am not speedy on math. I picked 10 because that was easy math. <laughs> So there are at least 200, if not 900, kids in your school. That's a whole lot of kids. And it's not just the kids that are there, right? You've got teachers, you've got the aides, you've got custodians, you've got a principal, you've got a vice principal, bus drivers. You don't have a bus a, a vice principal, but I know people are listening to the story. <laughs> I am just striking out here. <laughs> 
So what my point is, there is a whole ton of people associated with your school, associated with Walter's school. There's a lot of people in our lives. And what is wonderful is that God is there with you, with all those children. God is watching you. God is encouraging you and taking care of you. He is encouraging you in school. It's pretty wonderful. It's amazing. But the next step that's even more amazing is that God loves and knows all those people that I just named, every one of them, even the kids that you don't like, even the smart Alex and the know-it-alls and the, 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 the ones who always seem to disrupt, even the teachers that give you the hardest homework, God knows and loves them all. One more thing. Pardon? Yes, that's the hard part. God loves the kids who are mean as well. And God is calling us to love and know them too, to look at them with God's eyes. It's a very challenging part of being in a school. So let's pray today for our kids in school. Dear God, we pray for our kids in school. We pray for all the people at the school. I pray that you will help us to see each other the way you see us. Give us strength and courage and joy in our learning. Amen. So I'd like you to grab the clipboard today. I'm just going to check what I was going to ask you to draw. So grab a clipboard and a, and a uh, clicker thing. And I want you to draw a picture of joy. And that's, that's vague, Jane, and I know that's a little unusual. But joy. No, no, I'm saying the word joy, feeling joy. Because there's lots of joy in the Bible reading today. So that's a little abstract, but I want you to think, how would you draw that on a piece of paper? And then show me after church, OK? So grab your thing, go back and sit with your grandpa. You're listening for joy. Let's approach God's word with prayer. Let's pray. Storytelling God, send your spirit to open our minds and hearts to hear your word. Challenge us, change us, and move us to follow Christ, who speaks to us as a friend whose word we can value and trust. Amen. Our responsive psalm is Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Cleanse me with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquity. When criticized for eating and drinking with sinners, Jesus tells the parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin. Our first reading is from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. And Paul tells the people, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength and has considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I have shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith 
and love that are in Christ Jesus. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King Eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 10. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of the Lord. What I'm about to say, I do so in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have fun with ambiguous pictures. Now, I'm not sure if that's the technical term, but you know the kind of images I'm talking about. There's a line drawing dating back to 1892. Is it a duck or a rabbit? In 1915, William Eli Hill drew a picture entitled, My Wife and My Mother-in-Law. It's just one figure. And in one look, you see a very elegant, beautiful young woman looking back over her shoulder. But take another look, and it's an old woman slouching down, and the, the line of her jaw has become her nose. In that same year, D Danish psychologist Edgar Rubin created an image now known as Rubin, Rubin's vase, but it could just as easily be called Rubin's faces, because you can look at it and see a vase, or you can see two faces looking at each other in profile. Right now, there's an image circulating on social media. They ask you to say, is it this or that? I don't see either one. I think they're teasing us. <laughs> All right, it's fun. It's fun looking at these ambiguous uh, images. And once you've seen both images, then it's possible to flip back and forth and see them both. You appreciate both. Parables are a kind of ambiguous picture. They cause us to look again, to puzzle things out. And rather than trying to nail them down and think categoric categorically, this is what this means, we might be better appreciating the nuances and noticing all that they offer. Um, parables surprise us. Today we are reading two of Jesus' most famous parables, the lost sheep, and the lost coin. Now what are these parables about? Uh, are they about being lost and then found? Are they about repentance? And, and where are we in these stories? Are we in the stories? Are we lost or seeking the lost? Or are we the Pharisees hearing the story and nodding as the story unfolds? Are these parables of comfort or challenge or correction, maybe all of the above? Parables are ambiguous pictures. Now, being lost is a common thread. There are actually three parables in the Luke chapter 15, lost sheep, lost coin, lost son. We sometimes call it the prodigal son. We didn't read that last one, the prodigal son. It's the expanded version of the first two, and perhaps it's the one that touches us the most, because lost sheep and lost coins are one thing, but to lose your children 
that takes the story to a whole different level. The lost sheep and the lost coin follow a similar structure. One thing of many is lost. There is an extensive search to find it. There is an invitation to celebrate. And then Jesus sums it up. So the experiences of being lost and then found link the story, but they're not its most important part. It's the setting, not the summation, that tells us how the stories begin, but not how they end. Similarly, Jesus' summing of the word, his reference to repentance, is confusing. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. Where does repentance come in? Sheep don't repent. Coins don't repent. They are passive characters in this story. The only characters who actually do something are the shepherd and the woman. In the third story, the lost son does decide to go back home, but the father interrupts him before he can speak, and it's unclear whether he honestly is sorry or whether he's simply doing what it takes to come home. Other than Jesus' reference to repentance, there's not much said. So what are these parables about anyway? Jesus tells these parables because the Pharisees and the scribes have been complaining about his table companions. It's not Jesus' teaching that offends them. It's his relationship with the tax collectors. Jesus is eating with sinners. And so Jesus turns to the Pharisees and says to them, supposing you lost a sheep, and they start nodding until he suggests that they would leave 99 sheep alone in the open country to go find that one lost sheep. Who would do that? No, no, you wouldn't do that. Sheep wander. Sheep are prey for fierce predators. There's no mention of a sheepfold or of a junior shepherd who's taking charge. Yes, a hundred sheep is a large flock, and that sheep was valuable, but it is, after all, only one one hundredth of the flock. One wayward sheep is just the cost of doing business. Let it go. It's the same with the, for the woman who is tearing her house apart looking for that one lost coin. It's not clear how wealthy that woman is. is are are the, set, the ten silver coins all the money she has, or is it all the money she has at hand? We don't know. And of course, when we've lost something that we value, we look hard for it and we are glad when we find it. But it's not likely that we would throw a celebration party that would exceed the value of the coin that we lost. This simply doesn't make sense. We would not behave like the shepherd or the woman, but God does. God, Jesus, is drawing a word picture of our seeking, sweeping, searching God. God is like the shepherd who values every sheep in his flock. God is like the woman who accounts for every coin in that purse. God treasures every child in the family. And when one goes missing, God goes into search mode. God's nature is love. And love looks like the one who goes out tirelessly searching because the one who is lost is so lost that she cannot find her way home. Oh, it looks crazy to leave the 99 to find the one sheep unless you are the one lost sheep. Sometimes we tell this story as if it's the story of God calling to the unchurched, and it may well be. But a curious detail about this story is that the sheep that was lost was part of the flock. And the coin that was lost was part of the household budget before it slipped down between the cushions on the couch. This is a story for all of us, for all people who one way or another have become lost. This is a story about the God who searches. Sometimes we know we are lost, and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we get lost in a time of crisis, an extended illness, an unexpected death, a, a, a ending of a marriage. Sometimes we, we get lost in a world of bitterness, and anxiety, and addiction, or unforgiveness. And sometimes we get lost right here at home, when the scriptures that once comforted us seem lifeless, 
and beloved hymns sound flat. We get lost. But we don't stay lost. Our seeking, sweeping God will find us. Don't be afraid. God will find you. And when God does find us, the world cannot contain God's joy. For both parables end with joy. Joy that stretches from the earth all the way to the angels in heaven. And maybe that's wrong. Maybe that's what's wrong with the Pharisees and the scribes in this reading. They do not experience the joy of being found. They don't experience the joy of finding the lost themselves. They see Jesus welcoming the sinners and they grumble. Some of the language in this text is confusing and it would help us if we asked a couple of questions. Who are the sinners and who are the Pharisees? Now we've often talked about the breadth of the scriptures and of the different voices in God's word. And when we, we talk about sin, we usually follow the teaching of Paul who writes to the church in Rome, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin in Paul's thinking is not so much a transgression, the wrong things we do, but a deficit. Uh, it is part of what it is to be human. We are all sinners. However, when Luke describes sinners, he is talking about someone whose sin is so habitual, so much second nature, that everyone in the community knows about it. Uh, take, for example, the, fair, the, the tax collectors. Uh, they are working against their own people, cheating them on behalf of an oppressive regime. It's a different use of the word sinners. And while we tend to judge the, the Pharisees negatively as self-righteous, the Jews at the time recognized that the Pharisees were the good people who actively tried to keep God's law. Furthermore, in the Gospel of Luke, listening to Jesus is shorthand for believing in Jesus, for following Jesus. All of which means Jesus is welcoming the local untouchables and ne'er-do-wells, welcoming, accepting, and befriending, and the decent folk are concerned. And so Jesus tells these good Pharisees two parables about our seeking God and God's joy at the finding. These parables are not just words of consolation, they are also words of challenge. And we are not told how the Pharisees respond to the parables. In the next parable, we are not told how that elder brother reacted to his brother coming home, but the invitation is clear. Come and rejoice with God. Come and rejoice when the lost are found. Come and rejoice when God finds you. So what does it look like when a church is a place of rejoicing? A church that rejoices in our seeking God is characterized by laughter. This is not to say that we plaster on a smile papering over the cracks, but it is to say that the shape of our lives is one of hope and trust and steadfast love. A church that rejoices is a safe place for people to come to listen. No judgment, no gossip, no sideline glances, just a quiet confidence that God is speaking and that each person here may hear God's voice. A church that rejoices nurtures its people in the skills of seeking and sweeping so that it might join God in God's mission of seeking and saving the lost. A church that rejoices celebrates, and celebrates often. Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. Hear the word of the Lord. Our hymn is Come Let Us Sing. Let's stand and sing together.
going to sing in between, don't be afraid. Let's pray together. seeking God, we come before you in prayer, for you have sought us out and claimed us as your own. Thank you for showing us how precious we are to you through the life and love of Jesus Christ. In our prayers, we name before you other precious souls and situations. With your spirit, seek them out. We pray for those who feel lost in life, those who are frightened or anxious, those who are struggling with addiction or mental illness, and those who are sick, lonely, or despairing. May your reassurance and comfort find them. We pray for those who have wandered away, for those separated from their families by conflict or distance, for those whose relationship with the church is broken or forgotten, and for those who have given up on the future in despair. May your healing and mercy find them. We pray for those who feel forgotten, for those who think they are worthless or unloved, for those who believe that their sins are too great to forgive, and for those who are convinced that not even God can love them. May your love and grace find them. Don't be afraid, my love is strong. Stronger and I 
God of love, we confess that the events of this past week have left us feeling lost. In your grace, you provide leaders to serve and comfort us with wisdom and dedication. We give thanks for the life, Christian witness, and service of Queen Elizabeth, whose earthly life is now ended, and who has entered into the joy and peace you have prepared through Jesus Christ. We pray for her family and for those who will take up her duties and responsibilities Send your Holy Spirit to comfort and give peace to all who mourn her death and the death of any loved one. God of compassion, you watch our ways and weave out of terrible happenings wonders of goodness and grace. We pray for all who have been harmed by the violence experienced by the James Smith Cree Nation. Surround them with a sense of your present love and hold them in faith. Comfort them and show our leaders the way forward. Ever watchful God, you keep seeking out wandering sheep and lost coins, lives of all who are precious to you. Thank you for your attentive love and your patient compassion for us all. May we rejoice with you when any lost soil, soul is embraced and never substitute our judgment of them for yours. Make us servants of the mercy we meet in Christ Jesus who taught us to pray together. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn is Softly and Tenderly. Let's sing to God.
Rejoice, for our God seeks and saves the lost, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest upon you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Very good. 